Well, good morning. It is wonderful to see you all here this morning, those of you who are in front of me. And of course, we want to welcome those who are joining us all the way from Bradenton, Florida, all the way up to Cape Cod, Massachusetts. We have folks joining us via live stream on the phone and points in between. And so we want to say a good morning to everyone this morning. We're so glad that you are a part of who we are today, a part of worship, and we consider you a part of us, regardless of where your locality is this morning. And uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better, and uh, we are working on some different ways of connecting. But uh, we want to invite you this morning, connect with us in some way. If you need more information about who we are, if uh, we would love to know a little bit more about who you are. So again, you can endeavor to do that by looking at the website. There's some information there about how to connect. And uh, otherwise, we're working on other ways as well as we move along in this very challenging, surprising time that continues on uh, amidst COVID. But then, of course, with uh, restrictions relaxing. No one had to look for your name this morning anywhere particularly. You could just sit where you'd like to sit. And I know some folks have said, you know, well, I can sit where uh, I can hear you better, I can see you better, or whatever. You know, uh, of course we're creatures of habit and we have our own assigned seats whether or not there's a name attached to them. I assume that's the same in all churches. Well, all of that to say we are moving forward together and we are gathered here for worship and for those of you who are able to see this this morning I do want to draw your attention to this beautiful table here in front of me and I'll just read the caption at, at the bottom of our uh, worship sheet this morning which simply says the lovely floor arrangement is in remembrance and in honor of our US military veterans this Memorial Day and I think it's a strong statement about, you know, while there, it's always nice to have an extra day off work, it's always nice to find a good sale on something that you need or you want, but this time is about something much more than that. And we certainly appreciate this reminder this morning as we are so thankful for all of our active and veteran uh, military service men and women. So this morning we honor and we remember we worship, we look forward. All of these things we are gathered for today. And now I'd like to uh, invite Margaret Honeycutt to come up for our mission moment this morning. As she is coming, she's toting some things that some of you probably are familiar with as so many have taken part in this. And so Margaret, please tell us more about it. I needed visuals because I needed to say thank you. We've got backpacks. We have backpacks and preschool kits. We have family activity kits. We have hygiene kits. This one's empty, but we have 120 of these that are full. So just so exciting. Just so exciting. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you. I am so thrilled and impressed with our family of Walnut Hills for the response you've given to this special project. This was a little different than our regular box ministry. We asked you for two months to take on this project. We delivered backpacks in the parking lot and we are just thrilled. I'm here today to share with you that you have filled as Walnut Hills Church family, you have filled with your own hands 130 backpacks. Our goal was 200. We have donations to complete, and are in the process of completing 50 more. So we are at 180 of our 200 goal, which was a big goal. It was not a small task. It was 10% of the state's goal and I think we're going to make it yet, very honestly. But I'm absolutely thrilled that we have 180 with the donations and what you filled, backpacks. We have 72 preschool totes. Our goal was 50, so we exceeded that goal. And some of you learned that 
filling preschool totes was more expensive than you thought when you start buying books and little animals and the things that you want to put in there. But your heart was in it and you did it with 72 preschool totes, 120 hygiene kits. Our team kids helped us with that. They did about half of those. Very, very exciting, the things that we have to share. The family activity totes were an extra. We didn't want to put out too many things because we wanted to make sure we could meet some goals. But the family activity totes will go to all the families. And we were able to get 20 of those just voluntarily. That's happened. So very wonderful things, 392 gifts as of today to go to Standing Rock. If we had met our goals just as we set them, we would have only had 300 gifts. So even being just a little short of the backpack goal, we exceeded what we wanted to do. So thank you so very much for your love that you shared with the people for Standing Rock Reservation. My heart is just filled to overflowing. Every time we come and check the mission box, it was full. I would love to invite you all, but I won't because Susan would not be thrilled with me. But Susan Gasky's house is overflowing. As she has come regularly, she and Dan have collected the backpacks and the items that you've put in the mission box because it doesn't take long to fill. And on Friday of this week, we'll be making a run to Richmond using the church bus and another vehicle to get what we have as of this week to Richmond to pack away to be ready to travel to North and South Dakota. We will receive anything else that anybody wants to share through the end of the month. We'll make one last trip to Richmond if we have anything else that we need to take with us to Richmond. So feel free if you have something still around the house that didn't get here, there's still time. But truly, if we, if we collected nothing else, it's just so exciting to be able to say 392 gifts. I want to share with you, too, just the love and the effort that went into this, because each of you who participated, we have an idea, and somebody takes it and flies with it. We wanted to be able to, in each tote, put something that said, this was lovingly packed for you by members of Walnut Hills Baptist Church. That thought became a card and then became a lovely bookmark that will go in each backpack. So it's not just a message, but it's a message they can keep. This was designed by Wilma Rourke and Donna Land and helped to be made by the staff at the Learning Center as they laminated and as they cut. But on the bookmark it says, just for you, from our church family at Walnut Hills Baptist Church, Williamsburg, Virginia, Jesus loves you and so do we. And the verse John 3.16, something very special that will be in our backpacks that won't be in every backpack. But we wanted to know, we wanted the people who received them to know these were made with love. These aren't just things. We care about you. We're praying for you. And that is indeed what we want to continue to do, to pray for the people at Standing Rock. There are 8,500 people who live at Standing Rock. That's a lot of people. We're sending 2,000 family packs and 2,000 of most everything else, 500 of the preschool kits. But the Native Americans receiving these, we have been working with since 2009. The WMU of Virginia Baptist has been working and going there at least for a week every year since 2009. Some of you have probably been. That first couple years, we had a lot of participation from Walnut Hills, and we continue to annually have participation from our church. So thank you for whatever level, wherever you have participated. Thanks to Team Kid, who filled those hygiene kits. Thanks to GAs, who contributed backpacks. Thanks to each and every one of you, 70 plus family members of our church participated in this project. Thank you. I also want to share with you that we have a new WOM group called Hearts and Prayers. If you read all the things that come out to you, you'll find a, a little message about Hearts and Prayers that meets the second Thursday of each month. It's a Zoom meeting. It's open to anyone. It's open to all of you ladies. And men, if you want to join us, you're welcome to join us too. It's a time of prayer, 
a time of a devotional thought, and a time to speak just briefly about some mission project that's going on across the country or around the world. No commitments, you don't have to come every time, but those who have participated in this project have appreciated and enjoyed our time together. It was formed as a need to meet just more time to pray together and to come together to chat. We meet for about an hour. We have those things that I mentioned and you can come in and out as you wish. But please, if you haven't joined that Hearts and Prayers group, consider it as the second Thursday rolls around in June. And again, just thank you so much. Please continue to pray for the Standing Rock mission as they go at the end of July. Appreciate your support. Would you please take your order of worship and read responsibly with me the call to worship. Beloved, God calls us to come together in love. When we live in God's love, our love overflows. Please pray with me. Eternal Father, as we enter into this house of worship, come among us and manifest yourself to each person present. Show us the Lord Jesus as the only foundation of our faith. Make real to each of us the truth that we are your temple, your dwelling place, the home of the Holy Spirit, made holy and kept pure by the very Spirit of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Memorial Day began as a decoration day after the end of the Civil War. It was a day when family and friends honored those who died as a result of wartime conflict by placing flags upon the graves of the patriotic dead. What we now call Memorial Day was established as a national holiday in 1967, setting aside the last Monday in May as a special day of remembrance. Flags and flowers are used today to honor those who lost their lives and to unite us all as we remember their service. We pay tribute to those who died by committing ourselves to being peacemakers so that their deaths may not be in vain. Would you join me again in a litany, a Memorial Day litany, in your order of worship as we read responsively. We continue to worship with a moment of remembrance. We remember fallen soldiers and the sacrifices they made for others. We hold them in continual remembrance and ever think of them with you. We look to you, Father, for comfort and strength. As I pray, I'll ask you to join me at the appropriate moment in the Lord's Prayer that we'll recite together. Let us pray. Loving God, you who alone are holy and worthy of our praise, we, your church, come in confession and in need, for we are people of unclean lips and stubborn hearts who have yet to learn how to live beyond our half-hearted and half-loving ways. Lord, we pray this morning that you finish the work you began in us. Through your spirit, make our meek hearts bold that we may serve you boldly. Make our fisted hands open that we may serve others freely. And make our spirits free that we may move and breathe in the gentle winds of the spirit who guides and prompts who burns and cleanses. And having confessed, we are forgiven. And having asked, we have received. For such is your promise, and your promise is as sure as the bedrock of our faith, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Every promise we can make, every 
Many thanks to our ensemble this morning for providing that, and thank you all for calling us to that truth. Grace alone, grace alone. The Bible is full of that message, grace alone. Now this morning, I want to uh, read for you a short passage from Romans, the eighth chapter. This in the church year, the church calendar, is Trinity Sunday. And uh, it's, it's one of those days that reminds us that there are several parts, personalities, several you know, different ways that, that God inspires us, that God is present in our lives with the sense of Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, Trinity Sunday in the church here comes right after Pentecost Sunday. Graham talked a little bit about that last week. You know, that's the Sunday when the Spirit comes back on the scene. And you may remember some of you who have read the second chapter of Acts, where those who are together are dumbfounded by the fact that they can hear this Spirit and that they can hear others who they know speak in a different language. But what they have in common is God's love, God's Spirit descending on them that they can understand, they can be a part of. And then it's an amazing thing. So Trinity Sunday in the church year comes after Pentecost Sunday because, in a sense, we've just been reminded of that fact, that there is another part of God that God gifts us with grace, and that is the Spirit of God. Now, it's interesting because on Thursday mornings, we have this, we call it the Thursday Coffee Connection, where we gather together at Panera nearby. Whoever wants to drop by can uh, for those couple hours. And there's really no discussion topic, but it's interesting, the last couple weeks, the Holy Spirit has come up. Just in the sense of, what do you do with that? You know, how, how does the Holy Spirit really come into our lives? And, and those of us who, uh, who come from a Baptist tradition, uh, originally and perhaps for our whole lives, maybe have not heard as much <laughs> about the Spirit as some others who come from different traditions. Well, you know, the Spirit has been around since before. It's part of who God is. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, we, we get it first from the wind or spirit, the ruach, the wind or spirit of God. And it carries through into weaving in and out of all that's going on. It's, I always look at it this way. It's the part of things that I can explain no other way, you know, I say, well, that's God's spirit. I know you, many of you have heard me say this before, but when I'm up here like this preaching, you know, I, I have to have a sense that there's something else at work or else I don't know if I'd have the courage to get up and do what I do. God's spirit that sometimes surprises me even <laughs> with what's going on, and, and I count on it. I count on it as we all do. We don't have to be in a pulpit to count on need or recognize in our life God's Spirit. And so in a sense, in, in Trinity Sunday, we have, obviously, Jesus, the Savior. We have God, the Creator. And we have the Spirit. And Jesus even talks about the Spirit. The Spirit I leave with you as Jesus, in bodily form, goes away from this place, but not leaving us alone. So in Romans... Paul writes to the church in Rome. Part of this letter, again, just a few verses I want to read from the 8th chapter, reminds us of all that's going on, all of who God is. Beginning with verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and of children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. 
What a wonderful statement. Several years ago, while attending a preaching and worship conference in Nashville, I had the opportunity to step outside of what was the plan, at least up into that part of things, very close a week or two before the conference, from what was the plan into what ended up being the greater purpose. Now this yearly opportunity for me had come in a part of the calendar. It was always toward the end of May. I looked forward to it every year, rarely missed it. So I went to Nashville in May of 2010 with the hope of being once again inspired toward a refreshing approach to preaching as well as other parts of the focuses of worship. However, it was not the message delivered by the big name preachers and the stained glass clad sanctuaries of First Baptist Church in Nashville and First Lutheran Church of Nashville and Christ Church Cathedral in Nashville, which I found the full measure of the week's purpose. The spirit was at work. It was really a message delivered by a group of volunteer ministers who no one outside of their own congregations would recognize. In a flood-stained basement of an 85-year-old woman named Mary. You may remember the 2010 was the year that Nashville experienced a record-breaking flood. I'm sure those who were there at the time probably felt it was of biblical proportions. (laughs) Now, the thing about that is this happened very, you know, very soon uh, in, in May, and it was just a week or so before this scheduled conference. As a matter of fact, as I was watching the news, I was thinking, well, nobody's going to Nashville. Well, it turned out that those big downtown churches were spared. It was different parts of Nashville that were, you know, really affected by it. So, in the spirit of what you know, Christian thinking and doing is really about, part of that conference became an opportunity on a certain day. They had rallied together folks from the area who knew where things were. They had rallied together resources uh, throughout all the churches to identify people in the area who needed something because they had all of these ministers coming from all over the country to this place for this week and we could do something about it. Now several of us who were able to, who weren't flying in, brought loads of bottled water, whatever we could gather up in that small amount of time. Again, it wasn't that we had a lot of time to really prepare, but they really brought together a wonderful opportunity and a wonderful ministry in that short amount of time. In the light of the recent flood damage, we who attended the conference had a Thursday afternoon option to go and work a few hours to assist with relief to the neighborhoods which made up Nashville's large metropolitan community. Now, I remember the the church van ride. You know, you just get in the church van. I don't even remember which church it was, what was on the side. They commandeered all these things for this particular day. But I can tell you this. There were so many turns and twists. We got so far away from downtown Nashville that I couldn't have found my way back to church with a compass and a map. But we got to the heart of the matter, and pretty quickly, we went to what looked like a, a really a bustling metropolitan area. If you've ever been to Nashville, it is a happening place. Down into, again, the outskirts, where you could see debris just stacked on street corners. People just pushing their lives, in many ways, out to the curb. Getting into that spirit. We were there. Fifteen of us were assigned to Mary's basement, the Mary I spoke of, 85 years old, proud Christian lady. So 15 of us show up in the church vans. We had to take two because it's been a long time since you can put 15 people on one church van. You may know that. But we were men and women, us 15. We were Presbyterians. We were Lutherans, Methodists, Disciples of Christ, and the one token Baptist. We came from the north, we came from the south, we came from both coasts, where was even a Canadian present in our 15. Different voices for sure, 
As a matter of fact, if you've tried to understand the accents from different places when you're all together, it's almost like Pentecost, you know, was happening all over again. I can't believe I can understand what that person's saying. Different voices, but with one purpose that day. Perhaps somehow reminiscent of that Pentecost event. Paul reminds us, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Trinity Sunday, fancy as it may sound, as a matter of fact, it probably didn't show up on your calendar this morning. Trinity Sunday can serve as a reminder to us that even if we speak with a different voice, we are moved by God's Spirit called to care within God's providence, showing the love of God's example. This morning, we saw examples of backpacks. What a simple concept, right? I'm sure some of you just had a lot of fun filling those backpacks. No big deal for most people to do. Just put it on your list with a bunch of other stuff that you're already out doing. But for others, it's a really big deal and called to that common purpose. It's amazing what we can accomplish and what we're called to accomplish. And while we won't be present, Margaret, to see those faces, to understand what those small things mean, it's a big deal. Well, for all who are called by the Spirit of God, our children of God... Even proudly displaying our labels as we do, we are able to understand each other in the light of the task at hand. Well, of course, when we were cleaning out Mary's basement, we talked about some of the differences in our churches. Well, I'm a Lutheran. Well, where I come from, there aren't any Baptists. Those kind of things, you know. Getting into the spirit of things, We who spoke with many voices worked without being identified once we really got into things. We removed sheetrock and insulation, giving service to what the text describes as one of God's adopted children, 85 years old, but a child nonetheless, who needed desperately to feel cared for. Paul's letter speaks of a nimble and able God who somehow moves through us in the spirit of adoption. Now think about that for a moment. What a wonderful phrasing, the spirit of adoption. This ancient statement describes a large, diverse family, and we are inextricably connected to one another, all of us. This frees us up to blend our many voices, our many dialects, our many accents, into the movement of God's spirit as we experience it, as we are called to it. As a church, we depend on this blend, don't we? Because we depend on God's spirit in different ways. Different generations, we know often speak, it seems, different languages when it comes to how we all understand the world, what we find is primary, what we find is most important. But when we allow ourselves to adapt our plans to God's greater purpose, we find what may become a beautiful and a very unique blend where God is leading. Creator, Son, Spirit. Even as individual churches, we realize that in some respects, We speak different languages when it comes to how we do church. Just spend some time with a Methodist, a Lutheran, a Disciples of Christ. You know, make your own list. Throw a Presbyterian in there, throw in a Catholic, whatever you want to do. But just spend some time with folks that come from a different way of doing church and understanding things. And you're going to find some things that are different. But you know what else I think you'll find? I think where the spirit, if we allow it to come in, if we allow that part of God to be part of ourselves, what we find is the most important things we have in common. And if we try, if we work, if we pray about it, if we look together, we'll find places where we can work together.
perhaps you already knew that, but every once in a while we struggle with it. Yes, different generations, different denominations have a different language when it comes to certain things. But when we allow ourselves to adapt plans to God's greater purpose, we blend our voices into a stronger, more tolerant Christian voice, which speaks in terms relevant to our community, whatever community we are called to serve. Perhaps we think we're going one place, that's the plan, and then we find ourselves in a wet basement somewhere. Perhaps we are in where we live and we come with a purpose and a plan to get things back moving in the direction that they were used to be going, what we feel comfortable with with, and what we want. And in the middle of doing that, in the midst of doing that, we find ourselves with other opportunities that surprise us, that shock us, coming out of a time like ours. What will the church be called to do? Now, as we prepare for all Sunday school classes to have an on-campus option next Sunday, that's an exciting thing to think about. Now, some will choose to Zoom in, and if you have questions about what's going on with your class, please do contact your teacher, contact one of us. If you have a question about a class, I'm putting a commercial right in the middle of the sermon, please let us know. I say that because when we think about it, Here's where we put a lot of our efforts, our time, our energy, and our prayers. Let's get things back to what we knew. And we're going to be able to do that in a lot of ways. But you know what basements, (laughs) what basements after a flood, what pandemics teach us, what different things that we didn't plan on and in some ways didn't see coming? What that teaches us is there are other opportunities as well, and sometimes while we're making our plans, We're called called to adapt to God's greater purpose. We have to keep our ears open. Paul had that inkling. He had that spirit inside. God's rock, God's wind moving through as he was writing that letter to that far away church. But what of us? What do we hear this morning? As a church, we depend on the blend because we depend upon God's spirit. Walnut Hills is part of a rich ecumenical history in this area. And Walnut Hills is poised to be a voice of an ecumenical future, working together with those who may do things a little differently from time to time. My hope is that through this manifestation of God's spirit working through our churches, we will teach our children lessons about the concept of community that many of us have had to overcome from our own childhood experiences regarding other voices within God's adopted family. Many voices, one spirit, Paul goes on to say here, that if we bear witness to the working of the spirit, then we are God's children, and if God's children, then heirs with Christ Jesus. All three, in these very short verses, all three parts of a whole God. And we hear the gospel through Jesus as Jesus entered into a reciprocal relationship with many who he met along the way as he taught and as he healed. All his stories weren't from his own experiences. There were many voices present. Jesus' explanation of the kingdom of heaven throughout Matthew's gospel, for example, is likened to an experience of a a shepherd or a farmer or a fisherman or a merchant, a group of bridesmaids. These weren't all Jesus' personal experiences, but experiences of people who make up the fabric of a world desperate in the need of identifying themselves with their creator and their sustainer. People like you and me. Many voices, many voices receiving the spirit of adoption, joint heirs with Christ. Recalling this text has the potential to remind us of more than the history of our rich faith. It serves to call us from plan to purpose as we find our unique voices 
blending with others. <laughs> so that small ecumenical group working in Mary's house, well, we worked for about three hours that hot Thursday afternoon. Unlike today, it was very, very hot in that part of May. Mary watched silently from behind her storm door. She'd come and take a peek at what we were taking to the curbside. She'd look down the stairs and just kind of watch, see what was happening to her home. Well, at the conclusion of our work, a group of us walked to her door so that we could share a prayer with Mary. Before we prayed, however, this 85-year-old adopted child of God thanked us and recited from memory the first verse of the 27th Psalm. She said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my faith. Of whom shall I be afraid? And once again, as we find so often as we go to serve, we are served. That sweet lady's faith, that strength that she had, reciting that part that meant so much to her. And at that moment that she needed more than anything else, that word, that spirit, that truth. Well, one of our group prayed a, a, a prayer of relief and hope and reconciliation over Mary and her home. But it wasn't a Presbyterian prayer. It wasn't a Lutheran prayer. It wasn't a Methodist prayer, and it wasn't even a Baptist prayer. It was a purposeful prayer for Mary and for the rest of us. For as Paul reminds us, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So I guess you could say that prayer that day, that hot May, with the steam of ruined flooded parts of home on the curb. I guess you could say that prayer was a children's prayer for each and every child present. Each and every child today present, present. Each and every child, creator, son, and spirit, when plan becomes purpose and we find ourselves walking and talking as adopted children of the living God. When we find ourselves walking and talking and serving, understanding the voices of those around us, whether or not we agree, understanding the purpose that we share. If we pray a prayer, we pray a children's prayer. And all of the children of God said, Amen.
I'm so glad that each of you have chosen to be with us during this time for this worship. And all of us children are called beyond this hour into a world of need, a world of plan, a world of surprise. And in all those things we do it because we are called, we are loved, but we are never alone. If you are able, please stand with me for our benediction today. As we go from this place, may we go with God. And as we go, live simply, love generously, speak truthfully, serve faithfully, reflect daily, and leave everything else to God. And may you go now with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.